Tired of having an unorganized storage system and cumbersome crafting area? Can't figure out why nobody wants to live in your latest housing masterpiece? Looking for some tips on how to make your houses look less like shoeboxes and more like, well, houses? Well, stay tuned, because we're about to address all these issues and more. Hey there, my name is Salandrak and welcome to the second episode of my Terraria version 1.4 Beginner's Guide series. This series is intended for players who are new to Terraria or struggling to make it through the game, and will guide you along the path of progression from humble beginnings through defeating the Moon Lord. In today's episode we'll be talking about housing both for you the player as well as your NPC villagers. Specifically, we'll cover the housing requirements for players and NPCs, I'll show you a great crafting area and storage setup, and we'll also give you a few tips on how to make your building shine. Do note that I had originally planned to include NPC happiness and pylons in this video, but as I was making it things really started to run long, so those topics and more will have to wait for future videos. As with all videos in the series, timestamps are down in the description so feel free to jump around between topics. And as always, if you find this video helpful, informative, or at the very least somewhat entertaining, please hit that like button and subscribe to help me grow the channel. Now let's get started! In order for an area to count as housing, it only needs to meet a few simple requirements. Namely, you need to have an enclosed area that is an appropriate size and, with a few exceptions, has player-crafted background walls. For a player house, that's basically it, and the benefit of creating a house is that you can set your spawn point to that location using a bed, thereby enabling you to warp back to that location using a recall potion, magic mirror, or cell phone. That is also the location you'll appear when loading the game and where you'll respawn after you die. For the enclosed area part of the requirements, there are tons of options that work, including pretty much any type of block, as well as platforms, and of course all the various types of doors. Size needs to be a total block area, including ceilings, walls, and floor, of not less than 60 blocks nor more than 750 blocks of total area. As for background walls, it's a good idea to make sure the entire room is covered with player crafted walls, as this will prevent monsters from spawning in that area. That said, you can leave open windows of up to 4 blocks wide by 4 blocks tall, but doing so may allow monsters to spawn there. Using fences or glass is generally a better window option, and although the background walls generally need to be player crafted, naturally generated plank walls found in underground cabins can be used if you fill in any oversized holes. Other naturally occurring walls you can use for valid housing are the disc walls in sky islands and sandstone brick walls found in pyramids. Just remember though that if you put a torch in one of these rooms that otherwise meets the requirements for NPC housing, you may end up with a villager moving in there unexpectedly. Now that we've covered the basics of housing, let's talk about setting up a good personal home base. In addition to having a spawn point room, you'll also want a crafting area and plenty of organized storage. You'll also want to set up an herb garden and alchemy lab, and a fighting arena for boss fights and invasion events. That said, due to the ease of moving around the world via pylons, these different components can easily be put at other locations. Today we'll only cover the crafting and storage areas and we'll save the others for a later video. Let's start off with a highly efficient crafting area. There are a ton of different crafting stations that can be used to make all sorts of different items. That said, many of them are only used to make specialized furniture items and only a handful be used regularly for all of your gear crafting needs. Here's a good setup for your gear crafting station area. First, start with a flat surface that is at least 11 blocks wide and 11 blocks tall. Then, from left to right, place the following. A table, then a chair, then a workbench. Leave the remaining 5 blocks open, as you'll later be adding a goblin workbench purchased from the goblin tinkerer, and a safe, which will be offered by the merchant after Skeletron has been defeated. Starting just above the middle of the table, build a row of platforms 10 blocks across, and then, from left to right, place the following. A sawmill, a piggy bank purchased from the merchant, an anvil, and a furnace. Note that in order to craft the sawmill, you'll need to make some chain out of iron or lead bars. Also, as you progress further in the game, you will need better anvils and furnaces. There's no need to keep the originals, just replace them with the upgraded versions in this area. Next, place a row of four platforms above the piggy bank and anvil, where you'll place side-by-side -side storage chests. 
Place a row of three platforms above both the furnace and the sawmill, and above the sawmill place a loom, and above the furnace put a heavy workbench, and voila, a crafting setup that will cover almost all of your gear crafting needs throughout the game. I generally like to put all of my basic pre-hard mode ores and crafting materials in one of the two chests and put all of the hard mode ores and gear crafting materials in the other. This setup allows you to have one of the chests open while positioning your character at the appropriate spot to craft whatever is needed. For most items you'll need to stand either on the workbench or in front of the anvil, but move around if items from a particular station aren't showing up in your list of options. Now that we've got gear crafting covered, let's talk about storage. There are a ton of items you'll want to store throughout your journey and having a good organization method will help you find what you need when you need it. Here's a method I enjoy using, but feel free to personalize to suit your own preferences. I like to build rows of five chests across close to my crafting area, starting with two rows and expanding as needed throughout the game. The bottom row holds from left to right, statues, then food, healing, and mana potions. Next is furniture items, followed by building materials such as walls, crafted blocks, and the like. And finally, the bottom right chest is my general block dump, which will hold dirt, stone, snow, all the various types of wood. As the game progresses, I'll eventually move the various ground blocks, like dirt and stone, to separate chests somewhere else, but in the early game, all things blocks go into this bottom right chest. Early on, I'll usually start the third row with what I call a combo crafting chest, where I'll place material accessories that will be needed for crafting items that require lots of different ingredients as inputs. Examples are all of the things to make the cell phone, the onk shield, and the architect gizmo pack. I'll later expand the third row to hold hard mode weapons and armor and whatever else I might want to store later on. Moral of the story, whatever organization method you use, use something. Be sure to rename your chest and get used to hitting that quick stack to nearby chest button regularly to empty your inventory. Time to shift gears and talk about NPCs. There are 18 NPC villagers you can acquire in pre-hard mode, and by arranging these NPCs properly you can set up a fast travel network of pylons to get around your world quickly. We'll cover the pylons and related happiness levels in the next video. NPC houses require a few more amenities than a player house. Specifically, they need a light source, a flat furniture surface, a comfort item, and at least one block of solid floor that is not a platform. The light source can simply be any torch or any of the various candles, lanterns, or other craftable illumination items in the game. And a single torch is always sufficient, you don't have to make sure that the whole room is well lit even in larger sized dwelling spaces. Acceptable flat surfaces include tables, dressers, bookcases, pianos, workbenches, and even bathtubs. As for the comfort item, basically think of anything you might normally sit on, such as a chair, sofa, bed, and yes, even a toilet. NPC flooring can be a bit finicky if you want to use platforms. In general, there needs to be at least one block of solid flooring, usually in the middle, but if you're getting a this is not valid housing message, try adding more solid blocks. The last requirement for valid NPC housing is that it cannot be too close to too many blocks of an evil biome type. If your crimson or corruption spreads too close to any NPC houses, the NPCs will move out. An easy way to determine if housing is valid is using the housing menu query on the right side of the screen. The question mark will let you check a given room to see if it is valid, and if it isn't, will usually steer you in the direction of what needs to be fixed. You can also use the NPC portraits to assign villagers to specific houses. Just right click on a placed flag to remove it and use left click to select a flag from the menu and place it. A gold border means the NPC will always return to that room if they die and respawn, whereas a red border means the villager can choose somewhere else to live if they die and come back to life. And finally, before we wrap things up for today, here's a few building tips to help your houses look at least halfway decent. The best tip is to simply use a variety of materials when making anything. Each of the different types of wood has unique building features, both as framework blocks as well as background walls and fences. Combine those with different types of stone, stone bricks, slab, etc., and you can come up with all sorts of different combinations that could look quite nice. For example, this house has a framework that was made using dynasty wood, purchased from the traveling merchant, and stone slab, made from stone blocks at heavy workbench. 
Background walls on the main floor was a row of mudstone brick painted gray, topped with a row of plank wall and then more gray painted mudstone brick in the kitchen. I used stone brick in the middle and palm wood painted white in the left room. The upper level has rich mahogany walls for the lower section and white dynasty walls crafted from dynasty wood from the traveling merchant for the upper half. And the vertical supports are just shade wood wall. Here's another example from my ocean house. Here I used rich mahogany painted brown for the framework. There's regular wood walls along most of the bottom and simply palm wood wall for the rooms with brown painted shade wood walls for the vertical supports. The pylon room is brown painted bamboo wall and then for the pier I used palm wood fence and then rich mahogany fence for the vertical posts and living wood for the cross beams for the light posts. The next big tip is to add a roof. A flat roof is all but guaranteed to look terrible the majority of the time, but adding a roof can really complete a building's overall look. The simplest way to do so is just buying dynasty shingles from the traveling merchant. They come in both red and blue, but each can be painted to whatever suits your fancy. It's also pretty easy to make a cool looking thatched roof using a leaf wand and or rich mahogany leaf wand, backed by grass wall bought from the dryad or living leaf wall crafted at a living loom. For a jungly looking roof, keep it all green, and for a cottage style roof, paint it all brown. All you have left after that is to throw in a variety of furnishings and light sources, slap in a few windows, and your houses will be looking mighty fine in no time. Have fun building! Well, thanks for watching, and please feel free to refer back to this video as needed to remember how to set up a crafting area or anything else. And be sure to stick around for the next video where I'll go over NPC happiness, explain the mechanics of pylons, and give you an NPC placement strategy for pre-hard mode to maximize the happiness of your most important NPCs. If you found anything in this video helpful or informative, please smash that like button and be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications for future episodes in the series. I'll be trying to get a new video out every other week or so, schedule permitting. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one! Cheers!